What's up, world? It's Ryan Bantz again. A little different uh, flavor this week for our videos. I've been out of town on my, uh, I guess you'd call it my my book tour. Um, I got an opportunity to spend some time up in Illinois at their Illinois Cross Country uh, Track and Cross Country Coaches Clinic, and then at the Central California Coaches Clinic with my boy Rodro. And uh, also got an opportunity uh, this week to go down to Arkansas for about a day and a half and speak down there at their coaches clinic. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is that as uh, coaches, uh, we deal with a lot of the same problems all the time with our athletes, which is interesting because it kind of brings me to the conversation that we're going to have this evening, which is task versus ego oriented research and its impact in sports. So uh, as you guys probably know, I'm in the uh, sports psychology master's program at Mizzou, which is kind of a performance coaching master's program. And one of the tasks that we have this week, and I'm the group leader of that uh, group this week, is dealing with research when it comes to ego versus task oriented motivation and those types of athletes. Um, and so deliberate practice is one of the things that we look at a lot. And, and you're like, well, what does this have to do with task versus ego um, focus? Well, if you think about it as, as coaches, um, one of the things we try to do is we try to, you know, get our athletes in the best situation we can possibly get them. And we understand that over the long haul, it's going to take a lot of blood, sweat and tears for them to achieve greatness, um, which brings us to the 10,000 hour rule that's been uh, poo pooed by a lot of people because some people feel like if you don't have the baseline genetic talent or abilities that you could throw the 10,000 hour rule out or that some people believe that, you know, it only takes 3,000 hours to reach mastery where some others it may, you know, take, you know, 23,000. Um, and, you know, and then there's limits to that too. You have to have some of what we would call the lowest common denominator, uh, denominator skills, size, or strength. So if you're going to be an NFL lineman, well, I'm five foot nine, five foot eight and a half. Um, I'm never going to be an NFL lineman because I'm automatically disqualified by my height. You know, there's no amount of work that I could do that could get me there. But one of the things they talked about besides those types of things and innate talent, you know, another group would be like uh, world-class sprinters. There are people who say, well, if you're a world-class sprinter, you know, it doesn't really matter how much deliberate practice you have because you're either world-class or you're not. But the research shows that it takes about 8.75 years for even those people who are recognized as world-class sprinters to reach their top performance. And another thing I found really interesting in this research article that was kind of breaking down the whole idea of 10,000 hour rule is the different variances of how much of an effect it has in music, in performance, in education, in business, and then in sports. In business, it's like minimal. There's no, in fact, none, you know, there's nothing significant that shows that deliberate practice has anything to do with increased or improved performance. So it was like less than 1%. But in sports, the average that they came out with, no matter how they looked at the numbers is 22%. And the argument that was in the article was, well, you know, you still have whatever 78% of the outcome of a good athlete has nothing to do with deliberate practice. That's true. But if you're not devising good deliberate practices for your athletes, um, it, it, you're going to be missing out on probably maximizing that 22% possibility. The other thing they found out in that research that I found really interesting is when it comes to individual sports like running uh, or swimming, where there's more predicted movements over and over and over again, deliberate practice is way more important than in sports where there might be chaos. Uh, which then leads people to say, well, then the individual sport, you know, deliberate practice plays a larger role than in team sports. And then because of that, you know, an individual might be more task orientated versus ego orientated and task orientated are people who want to improve their skills over time, challenge themselves and get better. That's their big motivation where an ego oriented person is like, I want to be better than someone else. I want the notoriety of that. I want the opportunity to show in competition that I am better. But the reality is, is that, um, you know, in those task oriented sports, that may be true because it's easier and it's usually you versus a clock, uh, maybe you versus one individual, but ultimately, ultimately, you know, the, it comes down to what are we trying to deliberately practice? Because there are moments where there isn't as much chaos, even in team sports, for example, shooting free throws in basketball, 
you know, James Harden had like 18 for 31 on free throws and still scored 60, 61 points. Well, you know, deliberate practice in that situation probably helped James out a little bit um, in his basketball game, would make him a lot harder to deal with if you couldn't foul him and expect he wasn't going to shoot a good free throw percentage. So kind of looking at that data and stuff, for me, I have a hard time because there's a little bit of bias with kind of understanding the research and the 10,000 hours and how people look at it as being this hard number versus kind of maybe being a threshold of the medium. Okay, next one was uh, landscape of achievement, which was this idea of task versus ego. And this is actually written by Dr. Orr. And one of the biggest things is that, you know, the idea that should there be a difference in focus? And one of the conversations are is that people that tend to be more task focused have all these really positive traits that come with them that make them a, a better teammate, a better person to be around, a better kid to coach, um, where an egoed athlete may be more likely to, you know, uh, make morally questionable behaviors and things like that. But the reality is, too, is that some of us are just geared different ways. And again, sports plays a big role. If you're kind of a task oriented person, that probably could help you in the practices of uh, individual sport, but yet being an ego focused person would really help you narrow down in an individual sport because it's all on you. If you ever see a hundred meter sprinter, you would never say there are people without egos, they're gunslingers. And so it's interesting to kind of see how this interplay kind of connects to each other. And we want to have this normative understanding of strategy that we can put together dealing with an ego versus a task oriented person. And the reality is, is it's still going to be pretty individualized. And also through this information is that you also have to think about genes. There's a, uh, they pretty much narrowed down that there are people that have a warrior gene or a thinker gene. Well, I guarantee, and uh, we'll see this hopefully throughout the semester that that ties into task oriented people versus ego oriented people. So it really has to do a lot with the sport competition practice, and the strategies that we use as coaches is really dependent on what's the situation. Are we talking about competition? Are we talking about a competition in individual sport or a team sport? Are we talking about a person with a warrior gene or a thinker gene? Are we talking about a person who tends to be more motivated in these situations or not? Is it a sport that's very rudimentary with no um, surprises at all in terms of what to expect? You know, when you jump into the pool, it's rare that somebody is going to reach over into your lane and kick you. You don't have to prepare for that. Where in wrestling, one-on-one, -on -one, you have to prepare for a whole assortment of things. And uh, same thing with MMA versus boxing, where it's like they get to hit you from here to here most of the time legally. That's all you have to prepare for. Where in MMA, they can hit you with pretty much anything at any time, anywhere. So these are things that, you know, it's pretty interesting when you look at narrowing down our strategies. Um, Assessment, when we're looking at, you know, the actual questionnaires that we get asked for the trying to figure out if a person's task oriented or ego oriented, it is interesting that across pretty much all the questions that people who are task oriented tend to lean to practice and those type of situations where the um, ego oriented person tends to lean more towards competition. And then the other thing that was really interesting is in our, our last reading that we had for this week, which was a really strong point, is that all of us as coaches need to understand that no matter how task oriented we are, no matter how much we preach the process, the grind, doing the things that you need to do as an athlete to make yourself better, those incremental goals that are not so based on outcome, they're based on process, right? So outcome people, ego, right, sprinter, whatever, athlete, you know, ego oriented, probably be more outcome oriented versus kind of the task, right? But the reality is, is that everyone slides to the more ego oriented normative assessment of themselves when we get to competition, because naturally, no matter how much we talk about the process, no matter how much we want to look at each individual competition as a beta test for the final product at the end of the season, we can't detach ourselves from measuring us versus them, whoever we may be competing in, and that it's really important that all athletes are going to struggle with that as they move through um, 
their season, especially in a competitive cycle when they're competing. So you can preach that, you could talk about that, but there's also a time and a place, right? So in practice, we want them to be able to understand the grind and the steps and the reality of everything that they're doing. They want to know the why to what they are doing, right? But in competition, to elevate that person to where they need to be, we may have to move to more egocentric type of cueing and ideas, the us versus them, the win one for the Gipper type of situation. But every athlete has an individualized arousal level, which I'm sure we're going to talk about more when we talk about applied sports psychology this semester, that we want to get to. And that's really important that you can have these tasks and you have these skills. And the other thing is, is that everybody starts with a different baseline. So that's the most confusing thing ever is that you may have an athlete. It's none of these people are, are starting at neutral, right? So they already come to you with, I don't want to call baggage because that's not right, but just an orientation of where they're at psychologically, like what motivates them to be a part of the team, what motivates them to be there. For me, when I first started doing sports, sports saved my life. And the reason why sports saved my life is because it was the first time I ever felt cool as a young person. It was the first time I ever felt like I had some worthiness that I could prove I'm better than you. No matter how much you pick on me, you can't beat me in a hundred meter dash. It's not going to happen. I'm faster than you. And that gave me a feeling of self-worth. It wasn't about the task. It wasn't about getting better. And the other thing is, is, which was mentioned in our readings this week, was the idea of like young kids, they're not going to be at that level three depth of understanding of the process and how all these things connect and the method and the system in which we have to move forward to get better. They, they're not going to do that. So for young people, that's a whole nother thing. You know, your strategy can't be let's grind and let's just keep failing forward and fail forward and fail forward. The young people, if they're going to enjoy it, it's got to be fun. Jocko Willick talked about how he just beat his daughter to death when it came to jujitsu and that his daughter just grind and would have her go up a weight class and age classes. And she didn't enjoy it at all. You know, and he thought he was doing the best thing by making her tough and, and, and rugged and gritty. But the reality was, is that she, he went too far with it. There's this sweet spot, that stretch spot that I think is really important when we look at our focus and our motivations for sport and how we as coaches apply it. Well, guys, that's all I've got to say today for that. I wanted to keep this one short and sweet because uh, I don't want to have my, my group have to listen to me ramble on and on and on when I share this on YouTube for them. But, uh, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. Guys, I'm, I'm going to be talking a lot more as we move throughout the spring. I know I've been kind of away for a while because I just have only so much bandwidth for my, uh, my days and, and my family and my kiddos and the, and the kids I teach and all that kind of stuff. But I really appreciate you coming on. If you have any suggestions, comments, things you want me to talk about, hit me up. You know, I, I would love to discuss it. Really excited about all the things that are going on this spring coming up for my individual track and field team. We've got a bunch of kids working out and doing great things in the off season. So if you want me to talk about that, I certainly can. And uh, please visit my YouTube page too. I've been putting up some videos up there uh, on, on my YouTube page that are separate to stuff that I do here on live. And then also on my Twitter, I, I had the opportunity to uh, record my entire presentation that I did on building a culture out of nothing on my Twitter page. So you can find that on there too. Thanks guys. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your Saturday. We'll talk soon. Love you. Peace.